God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Welcome to the Hour of Deliverance. <clears throat> I'm Reverend Dr. K.E. Holmes. However, today it might not even matter who I am, except for that's never true. Even as I said it, just as I said it, it didn't fall on a place of truth. I remind you often how in Job it says, uh, the ear tries words the way the mouth tastes meat. One of the things that's about is what happened just now. I said something and the flavor of it wasn't in truth. It was not true. Though I wouldn't have said it if I didn't think it to be true. However, the ear could taste. The ear, not just hearing, the way the mouth tastes me, the ear could hear that, ah, oh, that didn't have the ring of truth. It didn't fall in the place of truth. Okay. Now, what we're talking about today has several aspects to it. So you might want to get a pencil and write down the scriptures. Because me being a theologian, did I say I'm Reverend Dr. K.E. Holmes? Me being a theologian, I get all into the scriptures and I examine the scriptures from... Uh, First of all, from the place of what Ephesians tells us about edifying one another in the love of God, the height, length, depth, and breadth. And I actually want to memorize that in order because God says things in order on purpose. It teaches us. And to know things out of order would be like learning the alphabet out of order. It's not going to stop you from learning how to read and how to put TH together and BR together and ST together. It will not stop you from learning how to read if you learn the alphabet out of order. As a matter of fact, I taught my children how to read by the time they were two, all three of them, before they ever learned the alphabet. However, to get the point across to you, most of you learned the alphabet. I do want you to understand that God gives things in order. We tend to pay it no mind. And even me, knowing that, this is like the scripture I just mentioned about the love of God. And he says, I actually don't want to go to it right now because I want to give you all these scriptures that I want to use today about our enemy being defeated. However, as a theologian, I, take, I tend to take every scripture in the depth, as, as deep as I know to go with it as deep as I can find in the scriptures, as broad as I can see in the scriptures. And I don't mean broader than, I mean the breadth that God gave to it. I mean the length to the extent that God gave it. Okay, height, length, breadth, depth. Go, go look up the scriptures so that when you look up things, or when you look to God, as I'm looking up, I'm, I'm realizing that I do that when I'm praying. Uh, so many people pray with their head down, and that's fine. I'm saying that I tend to look up because of my habit of praying and going to the throne of God. That habit happens because God having invited me to his throne way back in 1968... I learned something about there, and several of you, people of excellence, I always let you know you're people of excellence. You know this because God will give people of excellence to know and understand that thing. And that is that when you're before his throne, there's flesh doesn't reign. Flesh isn't in control, and flesh is not in the way. Now, in this earth, on this earth, f flesh is not going to heaven and flesh is not going in the rapture. Remember, we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. I mean, that's faster than you can blink. Flesh is not going. So flesh will argue with you and flesh will have all kinds of trouble, even against what you decide in your mind. Because God honors what you decide in your mind. Remember? Remember? Choose ye this day, he said with, to Joshua and to the, all the people of Israel. Choose ye this day. Not only you choose, but you choose today right now. Whom ye will serve. God gives us the choice. 
Oh, yes, he does. He also gives us the win this day. And he also gives us the what? Whom ye will serve. See, there I go, being a theologian, breaking it down this way, that way, the other way. God gives us choice. However, he lets us know what the good choice, what the right choice is. And I want, even as I say good and right, I want to remind you of the scripture that says about the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Look it up. And when you look it up, you're going to find that sometimes he just says the good will of God. And every time that startles me because the first time that he gave me the revelation of it, what he gave me was good, acceptable, and perfect. (laughs) Then for the way that he taught me to study his word, I knew to go back and find the first time that he said good relating to his will. How did he say it? Because he taught me that the first mention of anything in his word is the nucleus, the core of that thing. Every time you see it in the word, even though he may give you more about it, even though he may fill in, even though there's more revelation concerning it, every time you see it, what he showed and what he gave in the first time is the core. Now, there's a couple of things. I'm glad God taught me that <laughs> and not man, because you do. I did. They did say that in some of my college courses, not all of them, uh, that had to do with scripture and theology and and all of that. However, I'm glad God taught that to me before uh, man, because the first mention of a couple of things is not nice. The the, 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 the woo. Like the first time he mentions prophet? Oh my, oh my. When he showed it to me, I I had to know, and I did know, that God was giving it to me, telling it to me, and showing it to me. Which is where I got the expression that I use. Some people used to think I was saying scripture. No, it's my expression that God is his own best interpreter, and the word of God is its own best commentary. See, I'm going to go use a commentary, hopefully, or maybe not hopefully, but today I have the app up here on Strong's Concordance. God is his own best concordance. Here again, one of the things God taught me, and in the using of a concordance, is to find every place that he uses a phrase or a word and read them all and see how he uses it. And then you get to find out that he doesn't use the same word or the same phrase every way. So then you want to group the scriptures where he uses it this way, when he uses it that way. And that's where it's good to know the order that he says a thing. And one example of that is uh, there was a period of time in my adult life where preachers everywhere were preaching, when God says all, he means all, A-L-L, all. And you'll find that in the scriptures, when God says all, he has already defined the context in which he's speaking in. So that if it's all of those in the room, it's not all humans on the planet. When he says all of those who were sick, it's maybe all of those in his presence, not everybody on the planet. Do you understand, okay? And sometimes some of us are so intelligent, we know that, oh, well, that's ridiculous to think that. The thing of it is, what I'm going to share with you today are some things that are ridiculous, but we're doing it, we're moving in it. And I mean, those of us who ought to know better, those of us who God has put in leadership, as well as those who God has them, but they're in leadership. Anyway, I'm going to give you the scriptures because just to discipline me, I want to read them all and not commentate on them all. Now today, what we're dealing with is the enemy. Now you, you might want to say the devil, don't do it yet. If I don't get to it today, it might be next week's program where we're going to look at the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil. 
and us identifying everything as the devil. However, I'm going to call this today, the enemy is already defeated. He doesn't have a home. He's already been displaced. And now my, my oldest daughter, my middle child, she's, she's quite an adult grown and beautiful woman. Uh, but on her Facebook, on her Facebook, she dealt with that so well, and she is a preacher's preacher. However, what I'm going to give is not a correction or anything of what she gave. That was beautiful and wonderful. I'm going to give what God began to give me on that, okay, on this this aspect and this understanding that the enemy, no matter what you call him, He's already defeated. Okay? He does not have a home. He has a place. He's been displaced. And she had more that I'd like to repeat on that, but I didn't I didn't quote that. I, I want you to understand by Christ Jesus the Lord. And I'm going to remind you up front, as you hear these scriptures and as you look them up, do understand that when the scripture tells us Jesus, it has more to do with Jesus and his humanity. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have to do with his being fully God. However, we want to understand the humanity. There are certain things that he accomplished that could not have been accomplished if he was not a human. And we need to know that. We need to get the understanding of that, not get it mixed up. And not make it that he's so God that he was not man and is not man. Remember, his, his being a man, he went to the cross. And when he came back... He had the scars from his manhood. Some of you want to understand that and haven't thought about that and need to understand that. That some of the scars that you have in this earth, while the tears will be wiped away. I don't know if you can see in my arm, but I've noticed since I was a very young girl that I bruise. And I wouldn't say easily. However, there's certain kinds of bruises that happen and then they don't stay away. Now, you probably can't see it on, on this unless you, you, those aren't just marks in my skin. They are bruises. And, and I think it's this one. Well, you're looking at it and I'm looking at it from a different way. I'm in my 70s. One of these bruises is from when I was a teenager. I think I wasn't even 15 yet. And I burnt myself with an iron. And not so that I had to go to the hospital. Now it felt like it and I carried on and it hurt so bad and it, and it took a while to heal. However, all these decades later, that bruise is still there. And then I didn't get married till I was in my 20s, already into my 20s. And I wanted to be such a good wife, and I was ironing my husband's shirts. And I knew good and well, I don't need to try to iron anything because I do tend to catch my arm with the iron <laughs> before trying to put it down or this, that, and the other. Well, don't you know, at 20-something years old, I did it again. And it wasn't even as bad as the one I did in my teens. But the bruise, decades later, it's there. Just a couple months ago, I forgot how I did the one you can that one I know you can't see, but because uh, I can't turn my arm the right way, but right under my wrist. And even as I'm looking at that, there is a scar from a doctor's incision on my wrist 
that happened in my teens, and that scar is there. And that was before, that was when they stitched it up and didn't do it as nicely as they did later. However, just a couple months ago, there's two dots in my arm. And whatever the bruise was, I don't remember right now, but it's there. It's healed up. The skin is smooth. But the bruises are there. I want you to understand this about humanity and our humanness has aspects that we don't tend to bring that the word of God has taught us and said to us. And part of that is because we're too busy looking at the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil. And you can, well, anyway, so the scriptures that I want to give you, I'm going to read them off this paper because I'll keep interrupting myself. Colossians 2.15, specifically look at that spoiled principalities and powers. Look at that. Luke 10, 18 through 29. But pay attention that Jesus said he saw Satan as lightning. Light and light, not lightning, as lightning falling from heaven. Remember, the subject is that the enemy already defeated, no home already displaced. Okay? Isaiah 4 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? So you want to go read it, because I only gave myself notes here. Because I want you to see that while he's talking to one king, he's specifically talking about God identifies. You want to know that in his word. He's talking about Lucifer. And I want you to catch the different names and definitions so that we are not so parked on the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil. It's not that God doesn't say the devil, and it's not that he hasn't given us some revelation of the devil, but we've parked on one so much that we and identify everything as the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil, that we don't recognize some other things, and we don't recognize the things that he also taught us, is teaching us, and that we live... And the victory that we are to live and that has been provided. If we just make everything the devil, the devil. And don't see what God, our God, the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, the Lord. If we don't remember what he said, what he gave. And even the aspect of himself that he was is speaking from when he gave it. Which is why I want you to really understand that Jesus Christ the Lord, when we see Jesus, just Jesus, the emphasis is on the humanity. It doesn't exclude the other things, but that's where the emphasis is. And emphasis means so much to our understanding. I'm a mother. Most of you, all of you are children, so even with parents, no matter how they were, because everybody wasn't the kind of parent that my husband and I were, God taught us what to do and how to do for the children that he knew that he was going to give us. However, you know this, that if your mother says, let's say your name is Tommy, if your mother says, Tommy, the emphasis in the tone of voice or even in the way that she's singing it has a different meaning than if she says Tommy emphasis gives understanding also warning or if she says Tommy and I could go on but you understand you understand God in his word why you want to look up or why I'm glad that I listened when he taught me to look up everywhere he uses that and see how. Okay, so uh, that's good about Jesus because we know that that's the name above every name. However, go back and look at where that scripture is and see, does he use the entire title? What part of it? And does he say Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus? Because the one that comes first, and then you want to look up 
in the uh, Greek to know which way it was in the Greek because it could be le- le- wrong. And you don't have to know Greek. You can see the difference between Christo, which word and which word. Okay? You don't have to know Greek. You can see the difference. Okay? However, in that Colossians 2.15, for instance, Christ, that's the things messianic, the things Messiah. And you want to look up the scriptures about that, even though they're Old Testament scriptures, they're what we call messianic scriptures. And even then you want to look, you want to keep things in order. Because the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. Well, because, and then anointed me, and then to do what in what order. And then you find out that he said to who to do this and to who to do that and how. Most of us don't pay that any mind. We just want to be evangelical. Hmm. Not getting that. He mapped out. He gave us the map of the how in the Messianic scripture. And then some of the things that happen in that case, one of them, it lets you know about tearing down the waste places. But then right behind that, it lets you know that men will call you. And we all, oh, we don't men to call us anything wonderful or good. Now we get really bad and down if they call us things that are not good. However, in that place, he's talking about things will be appreciated about you and they'll call you and they'll give you titles. And we haven't learned how to say thank you. And I especially am guilty of that. Someone will say, oh, you look nice. Ah, You know, uh, we used to say, oh, give God the glory. Well, guess what? People learn quicker to give God the glory when you just say thank you and let their appreciation and their thanksgiving move them into gratitude. And move them into acceptance of who God sent. And most of us don't even recognize that that helps them to accept how God is using them. I said I didn't want to interrupt myself ten year ago. However, do remember that God is exceeding abundantly able to do above all, all look it up, make sure it says all that we ask most of us if you listen to us, especially leadership when we're praying, we're not so much asking as demanding ask or think and most of us people of excellence we have fabulous imaginations so we can think Not only just intelligence, but he says, ask or think that even what you can imagine. When my children were little, now they're, they're fully, fully, fully adults now. When they were little, because I'm a writer, I taught them to write and to write journals of things that would cross their mind and, and write stories and, and to be a book or to be a whole chapter so that they would train their mind to see the different ways that a certain thing could be, a different way it could map out. Now, more than that, we gave Proverbs as when they were tiny, 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 tiny. My husband and I always did that before they were born, so they had that their entire life the, the for whatever day of the month it was, we would read that entire chapter of Proverbs. That why That's part of why it was so important to teach them how to read. Because I learned from God about how he made the brain to work to know that they can read way earlier than it. it's taught in school. And I was an elementary school teacher so that I know how we teach it in school. So we want to know and we want to keep it the way God gave. And we want to be able to move. If God causes people to know and understand or experience you as a certain title, they're not giving you God's place. However, most of us, I always remind you, don't see the nose on our own face, especially people of excellence. 
If we saw a fault, we'd be all on our case, not realizing that we're not supposed to be on our case. God doesn't do that. When we repent, he's faithful and just to forgive us of all, forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But no, we stay on our case. We stay on our case. He doesn't. When we give it to him, he does transformation. And the transformation that he does in us, we usually don't see it. Even though he does exceedingly abundantly beyond what we ask or think. And most most preachers stop at that verse. And I always remind you that the verses weren't there until the 12. I always got to say both to remember the right. Chapters 1400s versus 1200s. Okay, the next verse tells you according to the power that works in you. Jesus, the power of God, and most of us don't even realize. I mean, we know it theologically, ideology and all that, that he raised from the dead. But understand as we're living, we're living from the resurrection of Jesus. We're living a resurrected life. Not just he. I want to go. I want to go there so much, theologically, and I want to give you these scriptures. Okay. Okay, Luke. I gave you Colossians two fifteen. I gave you Luke ten eighteen through twenty nine, so that you read the whole thing. And catch it in Colossians two fifteen. He's talking principalities. So that's not just, I won't get finished if I keep stopping to give you the theology on each aspect. Isaiah fourteen twelve. Oh, I gave that one. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? So now we have principalities and powers. And all of that is not the devil, by the way. Oh, I said I wasn't going to. Okay. We have in Luke, we have Satan, and Isaiah, we have Lucifer. And all of this is God talking. I mean, his word. Ezekiel 28, and definitely look this up because the way I wrote it, I'm not sure that I meant to write 28, but I think so. 28, 11 through 18. He's called the anointed cherub. And I didn't put the Isaiah scripture that I so want to put in there for us to understand that covering the Ark of the Covenant, he was the anointed cherub all by himself. However, after his fall, it's always been two cherubim. And for those of you that don't know it, when I am is on the end of the word, that's the plural of it. It's not cherubims. Cherubim lets you know more than one. Cherubim. Uh, cherub is the singular. He was the anointed cherub. And you want to read some things about that that God lets us know. The same way that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He lets us know some things. And we've we've taken that in. He lets us know some other things about other aspects of the enemy. And while we want to know that and learn that, we don't want to make that be the core of what we know and understand. What we want to look at is what God says about it in the victory, in the how we're not under him, under circumstances, whether circumstances he causes or we caused or whatever. Ah. God has given us the victory. Oh my. And not just victory. Yes, victory. Yes. And beyond victory, triumph. That's so much more than victory. I hope there's an expression, knocked it out of the box. Yeah. Because you can have victory where, yeah, the victory is counted to you. The victory is recorded. But knocking it out of the park or out of the box is a whole other. And Jesus did both. 
He gave us the victory. Anyway. Okay. And triumphed. And did it openly. I mean, so everybody knows what no secret thing. Because some of us, if you don't watch baseball, you don't know about the ones who knocked it out of the park. You might know the expression. But you don't know the experience for the person that does it, for the team that had it done, or for the, the onlookers, the, um, you know. But you do have an understanding of that expression. That's what Jesus did. He didn't just win the game. <laughs> he didn't just give us the victory. He didn't just win the victory here again. He gave it to us, but he got the victory. Yes, he did. And he triumphed and ju- and knocked it out of the park openly with everybody seeing, with it recorded by thousands. Actually, millions and billions, but uh, anyway. <sighs> Anointed cherub. Jude 1, 6 talks about angels reserved in chains. Hmm. Hmm. Under darkness. Yeah. <laughs> Jude 1, 6. I say 1, 6. There's only one chapter of Jude. But if I said Jude 6, I did that one time and somebody didn't even want to go look it up because they, she doesn't even know what she's talking about because there's not six chapters in Jude. So, you know, I'm letting you know. <laughs> I needed to laugh. I, I, I needed to laugh. And this is something that maybe I'll get to share a little bit. James 4, 7. Yeah, that's the fourth chapter of James. <laughs> and that's the one thing that today, I, I don't know how long I took. If I get to go through all of these scriptures or just some of them and keep interrupting myself as I do this, it reminds me of other scriptures that I do want you to go there. I do want you to know. I do want God giving you, pardon me, the revelation of it. That he'll work in you and through you concerning. Yes, all of that. However, what I want you to go away with, instead of identifying everything as the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil. And as you take on principalities and powers and understand that, and as you understand, yes, Satan, and as you understand Lucifer, And as you understand the anointed cherub and why it's good to understand that fact, and while you understand about the angels reserved in chains under darkness, (laughs) what I want you to move in and go away with and have resonating and echoing in your mind, your spirit, your soul, your experience Your trials, your victories, your triumphs. Resist the devil. And I don't mean like he's an opponent. And he will flee. Not box him out. Resist. And he will flee. Now, I, I almost hate to remind you that when you find that you're resisting and he's not fleeing, it's usually because it's your flesh and not the devil. Sometimes it could be because you haven't applied faith in Jesus Christ. You've put more faith in the power of the devil. But usually, in human beings, it's that thing that we see in Genesis of the serpent, not the devil. Though they're the same entity, but we don't get to know that till way later. <sighs> I told you I have the commentary here on the devil, so that I, I there's something I wanted to show you about that. That when we want to call everything the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil, the devil, I want you to remember the Gospels. And 
maybe next week we'll do it, and maybe I'll get time to do it this week, but I want you to see in the Gospels how many times the devil is mentioned and when it's the devil. And I want you to see how Jesus handled things. However, I want you to see who's always saying the devil. It's usually the Pharisees. And I know you're not trying to be a Pharisee. I know we're not trying to be a Pharisee. Because most of the time we see that Jesus was rebuking them for following doctrines of men. Yeah, whether they're collegiate doctrines or whether they're church doctrines, whether they're denominational doctrines, I will remind you that Peter, after the resurrection, and after Jesus is giving him a revelation concerning his own life. Oh, I don't want you to know this about Peter. I want you to know this about you. I'm just giving it to you in the word, the example in the word, so that they're not, we're not pointing the finger. I used to be good at that, pointing the finger at Peter. Until I needed, un- the Father gave me to understand. <laughs> I'm showing you this and giving you, oh, accurate understanding to apply to you. So I want you to understand, people of God, men of God, women of God, people of God, that after the resurrection, After Jesus gives Peter the revelation of himself, not just how he's going to end his life, but feed my lambs. Yeah, you did what you did. You denied me just like you said. And yeah, it made you so awful and feel so bad. Yes, it did and it should. However, it should bring us to repentance not just being on our case because we know that's so low, down, dirty, and awful. Yeah, when we recognize ourselves and what we did that's against God, it is so low, down, dirty, and awful. Even if it's not in those things that churchianity likes to identify as low, down, dirty, and awful. Because those things are low, down, dirty, and awful. Fornication, Lying, stealing, all of that. Yes, they are. However, you'll recognize that I mention often how in Proverbs, God says a thing that's an abomination to him. And even without looking up the word, we know that abomination is so awful. It is God awful. Yes, it is. And none of us are trying to be an abomination. And yet God is talking to us, not the wicked, not the world, when he says this, these six things doth the Lord hate, and do look it up. And he says, yea, yes, the seventh is an abomination to me, to him, to God. And he names all six of them. And then the seventh is he that sows discord among the brethren. And those of us who sow discord among the brethren never think that that's what we're trying to do. And we don't recognize that the discord among the brethren that happens, we never recognize that we had anything to do with it. And yet most of us do recognize areas. Hmm. Where that discord automatically happens? Because we have the expression of don't talk religion and politics. And yet we live in a day and time where the politics has the body of Christ. People that belong to the kingdom of God and are supposed to be all about the kingdom of God. Has us in discord and on discord. And we don't think we're being an abomination. And one of the things why I gave you all these different scriptures is for us to understand that God, each time he mentions these things and these names and these ways, 
that the one we call the devil, the devil, the devil, that he identifies principalities and powers, that he identifies Satan, that he identifies Lucifer, that he identifies the anointed cherub, that he identifies angels. And I'll remind you the serpent, I'll remind you the dragon, when you look at what God has provided, the victory that he has provided against the things that that entity causes or perpetrates, we need to understand that he's already been defeated, he's already doesn't have a home, he's already been displaced. And we want to be able to see how does God, what, where do we look for the deliverance? Because most of us, we have a scripture and it's not that it's not scripture. It's just that we know that that's how. Well, could there be another how? I'm often reminded, mainly because I live this every day. I told myself today, I didn't mean to, telling my age. (sighs) However, I am healthier today than I was in my 20s and 30s, teens, 20s and 30s. I was on disability in my teens and people didn't know it and didn't recognize it because it didn't make sense for a teenager to be in that kind of situation. So they automatically, you know, just, you know, scoffed it off that it couldn't, couldn't, that, yeah. Ah. And I didn't share mainly not because I was trying to keep it a secret. And by the way, I still live with, I don't tell things. And I don't tell them because what I say is generally understood in a way that I am not saying and have no meaning in that place of what the hearing is. And I learned from the word of God to minister grace to the hearers. And if what I say makes you understand something that's not so, I'm not ministering grace. So I pretty much learned to keep my mouth shut until... God tells me to share it. And and most of the time when God has me share something, it's something that I know good and well I didn't know that like that. However, I'm letting you know that even as a teen, I didn't share things. I think I've shared with you before that as a little, little teeny, teeny tot, I mean, not even as tall as the lowest cabinets and... Um, or barely as tall, and I overheard the doctors, and they were talking the way adults talk when they're angry at you, scolding you. And I overheard the doctors telling, well, my aunts and uncles at one place when we lived with them, we, my older brother and I, and then also my mother at another time, because I had a sickness in my belly that I knew about, because I was in pain all the time and cried all the time, and oh, you know. And uh, I heard them tell that I was drinking things that were under the sink. And back in those days, almost everything under the sink, under the kitchen sink, had a skull on it. Well, the skull, for me, as a tiny tot, it was frightening, and yeah. And I wasn't letting anybody know that I knew how to get the lock off under the sink. When I grew up and got older, and and after my husband and I had children, we had our first son two years after we married, and I watched him as a tiny tot. We put the locks on, and they were way better locks than when I was a kid. And he just took them off as if that's what he's supposed to do. I mean, he took time and, and, and got the locks off, the child guard locks, as if that was what they were there for, for him to... <laughs> And then he'd pull everything out and and set up what I call a drum kit. (laughs) Anyway, I'm letting you know, especially since Leah's not with me today, that she's such a treasure. And when you see her with things, that she wants to get this and she wants to touch that and she wants to do this, because that's how she sees it's supposed to be. And when she's scolded, that's part of why she has a fit, because what? It's supposed, I I should be able to touch. Anyway, back when the doctor said that, um, scolded, I heard them and talking 
I didn't know these words, but I felt these things. Talking nasty to my mommy and lying on my mommy. Because I knew good and well I wasn't drinking anything under the sink. And they, uh, the authorities, kept finding reasons to move my brother and I to another household because of this. And I didn't understand that fact. However, I knew that they were lying on my mommy. And I knew that I was not drinking anything under the sink. Nothing with a skull on it, would I? I didn't even want to touch it. And I went there uh, to share, to make it quick, and uh, to make you understand that we think things that just aren't so. So as a teenager, I, I, I moved out on my own when I was 16. The only thing is I was still underage and under doctor's care and didn't un- understand. Back in those days, doctors barely told the parents and certainly didn't tell the child the details of what was wrong or why and all of that. And in my case, they weren't telling it because most of the time it didn't make any kind of sense. And whenever they would say that that's what it was, then a few months later, they find out that it's not that at all, except for that I still had, was suffering from the symptoms. And it, now that I laid that out, I'm going to fast forward to today. People see me now at the age that I am, and they see that I walk funny. Now, in their mind, it's not steady. And that's because people that age have those ailments. Well, guess what? I told you. I'm healthier now than I was in my teens, my 20s, and my 30s. And what you're looking at is not age. It's not an old woman. I mean, I am an old woman by now, yes. I'm saying that where we learn to put things that we think are this, that, and the other. And I hope I told enough because I want to get off about testifying about me. Because it's the word of God that is the deliverance, not the testimony. It's the word of God the why I have the testimony. However, I want us to understand because we're in a day and time when our wrong thinking about things must be changed into the way God has revealed about this and not all of the doctrines, even hundred years of doctrines. How many hundreds of years had the Pharisees been teaching what they were teaching and making sure everybody followed what they were following when Jesus rebuked them? So it's not about how long. It's not about how long. The same way it's not about how old. It's not about how old. My children read younger than what the educational system of several generations said is possible and teach. I saw in the word of God that a whole other way. And I also found out that another person... Uh, almost a hundred years earlier, not really, but um, had seen that in the Word of God too and put it to work. And so my children read, and I don't mean see Dick run, I mean they, they read advertisements when we would write, go on the bus. I'm telling you, resist the devil and he'll flee. And I'm letting you know that yes, lay hands in the sick, They shall recover. Yeah, that's the word. That's word. However, what he revealed to me, I was told and used to overhear, not I was told. I used to always overhear relatives talking about that when I was born, I was supposed to die. And then I overheard different things about it. How some thought it would just be better if the baby would die because to live would be so many problems. I'm here. I didn't die. It wasn't lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It was he's life. He's the way. He is truth. He's life. And the life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And look that up because I know that we like to say faith in the Son of God. I live by the faith of the Son of God. And many times after that, they said I was going to die. And I used to hear the telling of when as a baby, 
I was put in the trash can. And it so happened, it was when the trash cans, as we know it now, with the rolling thing that grinds up the trash, when they were new. Before that, they, they just came and they just threw it in a big old thing. But when these were new, and our family lived in a neighborhood where, elite neighborhood where the new things happened first, and I overheard a lot, often, relatives talking about me being put in the trash can. Only they turned the the the, the machine used to make so much noise the uh, the trash thing, and something wasn't right about it. They were new, so they turned it off for a minute, and they heard the baby crying in the trash can. And so I'm here. If they dumped that trash can. Even if they found it or found me, no, I'm here. And then other times that I lived through, and like I said, in my teens, my 20s, and my 30s, more than once. As a matter of fact, at each one of those times, I lived through hard, horrible, long trial, painful, every day got worse and worse and worse. And when he delivered me, he ministered life, life. I want you to know, don't be so concentrated on the devil. Sometimes we need to rebuke our flesh, but all the time we want to look to God and his goodness and give him praise and move into gratitude and give him thanks for his wonderful works to the children of men. And you move in that with your pain, through your pain, through your trial. Some of some of us, the trials are like the three Hebrew boys in the fire. The smell of smoke wasn't on them. They didn't experience the fire. And others, others of us experience all that bad stuff. How many of us quote and are able to move in Elijah, Elisha, Elisha, who did twice as many miracles as the wonderful, magnificent Elijah, died of his sickness. That's one reason, too, why I let you know, don't say my headache, my diabetes, my heart condition, my this, my that. No, 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 no. Don't take it on. Take on the word. Take that on. Take on his praise. Take him on. What he says praise does. Some of the things that praise does is set things right in the earth. That's Psalm 70-something. I don't want to quote it wrong. People praise. I know we look at it, let all the people praise him, and we think it's a praise concert nowadays. <laughs> and not that it's not. Don't not have a praise concert. However, understand that people praise. The rocks, he'll have cry out if we don't praise. Remember he said that? The birds, we know that they give praise. But people praise. Let all the people praise him. Look in that chapter and you'll see that it causes the earth to yield forth its fruit. It causes the agriculture, all the things that are going agriculturally wrong. All the things that are going wrong in the weather. Praise sets those things right. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't do the things that we're responsible for in this earth. He gave mankind responsibility in this earth not just the garden that's why you want to see when he mentions about one of those scriptures that I gave you that he was in the garden yeah he lost his place he lost his position that was greater than the garden and in losing it he tried to huh? And I want you to understand, I'll mention it to you often. The serpent is subtle. You don't want to say the devil, the devil, the devil. 
you'll miss the subtlety. And then, like Eve, when you do kind of, kind of, and I, I know that's bad English, but I mean kind of, not exactly, but when you kind of recognize and want to bring it to where it should be, if it's not through his praise, and it's not through giving thanks, but through your seeing your mess up, we're not the ones who know how to correct ourselves. And that doesn't mean you should not correct yourself. However, you want the correction to be through the resurrected life so that we don't repeat it again at another time, whether we meant to or not, whether we were paying attention or not. You know the scripture, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. However, know the second part of it. Every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, thou shalt condemn. We want to make it God. Not that God doesn't condemn, but he has already. You see, our enemy's already defeated. He's already displaced. He already doesn't have a home. You speak the defeat. You, we, resist the devil. And he'll flee. He'll flee. I want you to know that. I want you to know that when it's Lucifer. I want you to know that when it's Satan. I want you to know that when it's the anointed cherub. Oh, he had so much. Part of why he hates you so much. Resist him. He had so much authority that couldn't be resisted. But when he didn't agree with God. That's why I want you to know praise and worship. Not this mind, pharisaical mindset of the devil, the devil, the devil. They were always saying to Jesus when he walked this earth as a man. The devil, the devil, the devil, the devil. Don't have a pharisaical mindset. Thinking that, oh, we're going to get the victory over this. He already gave you the victory. He gave us the victory and triumph. Walk it. Live it. And we're in times that if we keep doing the devil, the devil, the pharisaical thing, that pharisaical mindset will continue And it doesn't continue the same. It gets worse and worse until we're in idolatry and don't know it. And like what you read in the Old Covenant, by the time a nation, a people, recognizes they're in idolatry, they've been there a long time. They've been there generations. That's part of why God's promise is not this first generation Not the child that he said. And I don't mean not. I mean not only. But to the second and third and fourth generation. And so that we don't get stuck on that. To the thousandth generation. Resist the devil. And he'll flee. 